Good evening, and welcome to Third Church of Christ Scientist of New York City. Let's begin with singing hymn number 75. I'll read the first two verses. God comes with succor speedy to those who suffer wrong, to help the poor and needy, and bid the weak be strong. He comes to break oppression, to set the captive free, to take away transgression and rule in equity. His blessings come as showers upon the thirsty earth, and joy and hope like flowers spring in his path to birth. Before him on the mountains shall peace the herald go. From hill to vale the fountains of righteousness shall flow. Number 75. I'll read from the Bible and from Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures by Mary Baker Eddy. The subject of this evening's readings is hope. The Bible, Psalms. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God, when shall I come and appear before God? Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me, and my prayer unto the God of my life. I will say unto God, My rock. 
Why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be put to confusion. Deliver me in thy righteousness, and cause me to escape. Incline thine ear unto me, and save me. Be thou my strong habitation, whereunto I may continually resort. Thou hast given commandment to save me, for thou art my rock and my fortress. Thou art my hope. O Lord God, thou art my trust from my youth. O God, be not far from me. O my God, make haste for my help. I will hope continually and will yet praise thee more and more. Second Kings And it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem, where was a great woman. And she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was that as oft as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. And she said unto her husband, Behold now, I perceive that this is an holy man of God, which passeth by us continually. Let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall. And let us set for him there a bed, and a table, and a stool, and a candlestick. And it shall be when he cometh to us, that he shall turn in hither, thither. And it fell on a day that he came thither, and he turned into the chamber and lay there. And he said to Gehazi his servant, Call this Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him. And he said, What then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, Verily she hath no child, and her husband is old. And he said, Call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the door, and he said, About this season, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. And she said, Nay, my lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thine handmaid. And the woman conceived, and bare a son at that season that Elisha had said unto her, according to the time of life. And when the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went out to his father to the reapers. And he said unto his father, My head, my head. And he said to a lad, Carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him, and went out. And she called unto her husband, and said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the young men and one of the asses, that I may run to the man of God, and come again. And he said, Wherefore wilt thou go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. And she said, It shall be well. So she went, and came unto the man of God to Mount Carmel. And it came to pass, when the man of God saw her afar off, that he said to Gehazi his servant, Behold, yonder is that Shunammite. Run now, I pray thee, to meet her, and say unto her, Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, It is well. And when she came to the man of God, to the hill, she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi came near to thrust her away. And the man of God said, let her alone, for her soul is vexed within her. And the Lord hath hid it from me, and hath not told me. Then she said, Did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? Then he said to Gehazi, Gird up thy loins, and take my staff in thine hand, and go thy way. If thou meet any man, salute him not. And if any salute thee, answer him not again, and lay my staff upon the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And he arose and followed her. And when Elisha was come into the house, behold, 
The child was dead and laid upon his bed. He went in, therefore, and shut the door upon them twain, and prayed unto the Lord. And he went up and lay upon the child, and put his mouth upon his mouth, and his eyes upon his eyes, and his hands upon his hands, and he stretched himself upon the child, and the flesh of the child waxed warm. Then he returned and walked in the house to and fro, and went up and stretched himself upon him, and the child sneezed seven times, and the child opened his eyes. And he called Gehazi and said, Call this Shunammite. So he called her, and when she was come in unto him, he said, Take up thy son. Then she went in and fell at his feet, and bowed herself to the ground, and took up her son. Isaiah The Lord shall comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places, and he will make her wilderness like Eden, and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found therein, thanksgiving and the voice of melody. Hearken unto me, my people, and give ear unto me, O my nation, for a law shall proceed from me, and I will make my judgment to rest for a light of the people. My righteousness is near, my salvation is gone forth, and mine arms shall judge the people. The isles shall wait upon me, and on mine arm shall they trust. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in the ancient days, in the generations of old. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. I, even I, am he that comforteth you. Who art thou that thou shouldest be afraid of a man that shall die, and of the son of man which shall be made as grass? And forgettest the Lord thy Maker, that hath stretched forth the heavens, and laid the foundations of the earth. Mark. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. And straightway coming out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And immediately the spirit driveth him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him. Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. Luke then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you, that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons, which need no repentance. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Psalms 
I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of thy righteousness, even of thine only. O God, thou hast taught me from my youth, and hitherto have I declared thy wondrous works. Thou shalt increase my greatness and comfort me on every side. I'll now read correlative passages from the Christian Science textbook, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures by Mary Baker Eddy. Knowledge that we can accomplish the good we hope for stimulates the system to act in the direction which mind points out. We never need to despair of an honest heart, but there is little hope for those who come only spasmodically face to face with their wickedness and then seek to hide it. Vibrating like a pendulum between sin and the hope of forgiveness, selfishness and sensuality causing constant retrogression, our moral progress will be slow. Waking to Christ's demand, mortals experience suffering. This causes them, even as drowning men, to make vigorous efforts to save themselves, and through Christ's precious love, these efforts are crowned with success. There is a cross to be taken up before we can enjoy the fruition of our hope and faith. If the saying is true, while there's life, there's hope, its opposite is also true. While there's sin, there's doom. Another's suffering cannot lessen our own liability. Was it just for Jesus to suffer? No, but it was inevitable, for not otherwise could he show us the way and the power of truth. If a career so great and good as that of Jesus could not avert a felon's fate, lesser apostles of truth may endure human brutality without murmuring, rejoicing to enter into the fellowship with him through the triumphal arch of truth and love. The nature of Christianity is peaceful and blessed, but in order to enter into the kingdom, the anchor of hope must be cast beyond the veil of matter into the Shekinah into which Jesus has passed before us. And this advance beyond matter must come through the joys and triumphs of the righteous, as well as through their sorrows and afflictions. Like our master, we must depart from the material sense into the spiritual sense of being. The God-inspired walk calmly on, though it be with bleeding footprints, and in the hereafter they will reap what they now sow. Trials teach mortals not to lean on a material staff, a broken reed which pierces the heart. We do not half remember this in the sunshine of joy and prosperity. Sorrow is salutary. Through great tribulation we enter the kingdom. Trials are proofs of God's care. Spiritual development germinates not from seed sown in the soil of material hopes, but when these decay, love propagates anew the higher joys of spirit, which have no taint of earth. Each successive stage of experience unfolds new views of divine goodness and love. In the year 1866, I discovered the Christ science, or divine laws of life, truth, and love, and named my discovery Christian science. God had been graciously preparing me during many years for the reception of this final revelation of the absolute divine principle of scientific mental healing. This apodictical principle points to the revelation of Emmanuel, God with us, the sovereign ever-presence delivering the children of men from every ill that flesh is heir to. Through Christian science, religion and medicine are inspired with a diviner nature and essence. Fresh pinions are given to faith 
and understanding, and thoughts acquaint themselves intelligently with God. Whence came to me this heavenly conviction, a conviction antagonistic to the testimony of the physical senses? According to St. Paul, it was the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. It was the divine law of life and love unfolding to me the demonstrable fact that matter possesses neither sensation nor life, that human experiences show the falsity of all material things, and that immortal cravings, the price of learning love, establish the truism that the only sufferer is mortal mind, for the divine mind cannot suffer. My conclusions were reached by allowing the evidence of this revelation to multiply with mathematical certainty, and the lesser demonstration to prove the greater, as the product of three multiplied by three equaling nine proves conclusively that three times three duodecillions must be nine duodecillions, not a fraction more, nor a unit less. When apparently near the confines of mortal existence, standing already within the shadow of the death valley, I learned these truths in divine science, that all real being is in God, the divine mind, and that life truth and love are all-powerful and ever-present, that the opposite of truth, called error, sin, sickness, disease, death, is the false testimony of false material sense of mind in matter, that this false sense evolves in belief, a subjective state of mortal mind which this same so-called mind names matter, thereby shutting out the true sense of spirit. My discovery that erring mortal misnamed mind produces all the organism and action of the mortal body set my thoughts to work in new channels and led up to my demonstration of the proposition that mind is all and matter is not as the leading factor in mind science. Christian science reveals incontrovertibly that mind is all in all, that the only realities are the divine mind and idea. This great fact is not, however, seen to be supported by sensible evidence until its divine principle is demonstrated by healing the sick and thus proved absolute and divine. This proof, once seen, no other conclusion can be reached. For three years after my discovery, I sought the solution of this problem of mind healing, searched the scriptures and read little else, kept aloof from society, and devoted time and energies to discovering a positive rule. The search was sweet, calm, and buoyant with hope, not selfish nor depressing, I knew the principle of all harmonious mind action to be God, and that cures were produced in primitive Christian healing by holy, uplifting faith. But I must know the science of this healing. And I won my way to absolute conclusions through divine revelation, reason, and demonstration. The revelation of truth in the understanding came to me gradually and apparently through divine power. When a new spiritual idea is born to earth, the prophetic scripture of Isaiah is renewedly fulfilled. Unto us a child is born, and his name shall be called Wonderful. As human thought changes from one stage to another of conscious pain and painlessness, sorrow and joy, from fear to hope, and from faith to understanding, the visible manifestation will at last be man governed by soul, not by material sense. Reflecting God's government, man is self-governed. I hope, dear reader, 
I am leading you into the understanding of your divine rights, your heaven-bestowed harmony, that as you read, you see there is no cause outside of erring mortal material sense, which is not power, able to make you sick or sinful. And I hope that you are conquering this false sense. Spiritual sense, contradicting the material senses, involves intuition, hope, faith, understanding, fruition, reality. Material sense expresses the belief that mind is in matter. This human belief, alternating between a sense of pleasure and pain, hope and fear, life and death, never reaches beyond the boundary of the mortal or the unreal. When the real is attained, which is announced by science, joy is no longer a trembler, nor is hope a cheat. Spiritual ideas like numbers and notes, start from principle and admit no materialistic beliefs. Spiritual ideas lead up to their divine origin, God, and to the spiritual sense of being. The infinite truth of the Christ cure has come to this age through a still, small voice, through silent utterances and divine anointing, which quicken and increase the beneficial effects of Christianity. I long to see the consummation of my hope, namely the students' higher attainments in this line of light. It is well to be calm in sickness. To be hopeful is still better, but to understand that sickness is not real and that truth is can destroy its seeming reality is best of all, for this understanding is the universal and perfect remedy. The fact that truth overcomes both disease and sin reassures depressed hope. It imparts a healthy stimulus to the body and regulates the system. It increases or diminishes the action as the case may require better than any drug, alterative, or tonic. If our hopes and affections are spiritual, they come from above, not from beneath, and they bear, as of old, the fruits of the Spirit. In the Spirit of Christ's charity, as one who hopeth all things, endureth all things, and is joyful to bear consolation to the sorrowing and healing to the sick, she commits these pages to honest seekers for truth. Mary Baker Eddy Let's pray together silently for a few moments, and then pray aloud together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Let's sing hymn number 30. The words of this hymn are a poem titled Love, written by the discoverer and founder of Christian Science, Mary Baker Eddy. I'll read the entire poem. Brood o'er us with thy sheltering wing neath which our spirits blend like brother birds that soar and sing and on the same branch bend. The arrow that doth wound the dove darts not from those who watch and love. If thou the bending reed wouldst break by thought or word unkind, pray that his spirit you partake who loved and healed mankind 
Seek holy thoughts and heavenly strain that make men one in love remain. Learn, too, that wisdom's rod is given for faith to kiss and know that greetings glorious from high heaven, whence joys supernal flow, come from that love divinely near, which chastens pride and earthborn fear through God, who gave that word of might which swelled creation's lay. Let there be light, and there was light. What chased the clouds away? Twas love, whose finger traced aloud a bow of promise on the cloud. Thou, to whose power our hope we give, free us from human strife. Fed by thy love divine we live, for love alone is life, and life, most sweet as heart to heart, speaks kindly when we meet and part. Number 30.
This church is a branch of the Mother Church, the first Church of Christ Scientist in Boston, Massachusetts. We hold Sunday services at 11 a.m. and Wednesday testimony meetings at 7.30 p.m. We also have services in Spanish, Sundays at 12 noon and Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. All services are held online and in person and all are welcome. Third Church offers Sunday school classes in person and online for children and teens. These free one-hour classes are available each Sunday at Sunday school. Students learn how much God loves them and cares for them. They also learn about the Bible characters and lessons and the healing power of prayer. For more information on times and classes, please send us an email Third Church at thirdchurchnyc.com. Third Church of Christ Scientist, this church invites you to an in person talk on Christmas Eve, Tuesday, December 24th at 7 30 p.m. The speaker, Bobby Lewis, a Christian science practitioner, will address the topic Make Room at the Inn. He will explore the coming of the Christ or God with us and what that means in uniting families, communities, and the world. The talk will begin at 7.30 p.m. in the church edifice, 583 Park Avenue at 63rd Street and Park Avenue, Manhattan. Christmas music will precede the talk starting at 7.15 p.m. There will be simultaneous Spanish translation and child care will be provided. We will also broadcast the talk online at thirdchurchnyc.com and by conference phone. For more details, visit our website, thirdchurchnyc.com. Do you know how to pray effectively? Would you like to learn? Third Church of Christ Scientist, New York City, and other Christian science churches in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut invite you to replays of a series of inspirational radio talks which have been broadcast in October and November. The series, Spiritual Solutions for Today's Challenges, addresses the following topics. Prayer brings peace. How spiritual perception brings healing finding unity and abundance through prayer, and learning to love your enemies. The internationally based speakers are members of the Christian Science Board of Lectureship. Replays of each talk will be available at 710WOR.com slash spiritual solutions only through the end of November, and they will be available on thirdchurchnyc.com, our website, through the end of December. This meeting is now open for all to share experiences of healing and spiritual insights that prove God's ever-presence and power in their lives. If you're listening by telephone and would like to speak, press star six and wait until your line is unmuted. Please speak directly into the microphone of your phone. Your message will be easier to hear if you don't use the speaker function. If you're watching via Zoom, you can choose the raise your hand icon or unmute yourself and speak. I uh, thank you very much. Last night, at this time last night, I was in deep, deep trouble. And I guess you'd call it a severe case of indigestion. I don't know what. But I didn't think I was going to live. I didn't think I was going to make it, quite frankly. It was the, the uh, symptoms were so alarming. And tonight I'm completely free. But at the time, uh, 
what it was, I reached out with the, many of the ideas in the readings tonight, and um, I reached out with the platform, which uh, she tells us it's uh, in on page 330 in the science, chapter Science of Being. When the following platform is understood in the letter and the spirit bear witness, the infallibility of divine metaphysics will be demonstrated, and I certainly needed that. And it's full of just absolute, absolute truth. It's used for teaching the teachers of Christian science. And I, I had memorized it, so I recalled it very quickly. I still hadn't gotten above it, though. And I worked very much then with the scientific statement of being, trying to get above it. Still wasn't above it. And then I remembered, she says in practice, she says um, that uh, mentally insists that harmony is the fact and that sickness is a temporal dream. Realize the presence of health and the fact of harmonious existence until the body corresponds to the normal conditions of health and harmony. And so I did just that. I just started realizing um, that, that, that the har harmonious existence. And I've noticed in practice, you know, it's filled with imperatives. That's an imperative. Mentally insists he's giving instructions. It's almost like baking a cake. You can memorize the recipe, but until you actually do it, you're not going to have a cake. And the thing about practice is I hadn't been doing it. I've just been repeating words. But I started realizing the presence of health and the fact of harmonies in it. And I got, I got control. And then I, that drew, drew me then to the old gentle presence, but not the settings in the hymnal, the settings by uh, James McDermott, a uh, solo he has. It's a beautiful setting. Myrna sang it, and I have a recording of it. I listened to it endlessly, and I started thinking of an old gentle presence, and it was exactly that, realizing the presence of harmonious being. And the the solo, it, 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 the way it, it uh, the music works with the words, it brings out the meaning so beautifully, as, as Myrna sang it as well. And I, I could just hear her singing it, and I finally got, got freedom from it. And I fell asleep. And then a few hours later, I woke up again, and it started to try to come back on me. And then I realized something very thing I'd never seen before. And I, it was the healing thing. And that is, I had been studying the chapter of Genesis and Science and Health a lot. And it talks in there about uh, the seed within itself. And Mrs. Eddy says, Think, forget not for a minute that God is all in all. And I said, wait a minute. That's the seed within itself. It's in the scientific statement being all in all. She says God is uh, the seed within itself God, uh, is only if he is all and expresses all. And I realized, and she also talks about that's the resuscitating law of life spoken of in Genesis, the seed within itself, all in all. There's no room for disease, for pain, for anything, sin, disease, or death, nothing. And that, I fell back to sleep with that, and that, 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 since did, that took care of everything. But I had never seen, made that connection before with the fact uh, she says that uh, the seed is in itself only as God is all and reproduces all. And she says the seed within itself is the pure thought emanating from divine mind. Those were two ideas I really needed. And, and that was, that did it. And I've, I'll never forget that this is, she says that sickness is the schoolmaster leading you to Christ. First to belief in Christ then to the understanding of Christ is omnipotent, and finally, 
And so first to belief in Christ, then to the belief that Christ is omnipotent, then to the understanding that God and man are his reflection and the image and likeness of good. And this is what it was. It led me to see the truth I had, this wonderful truth. And so I'm so grateful for the readings tonight, bringing out the allness of God also, and for this wonderful healing and being completely healed here tonight and free of this. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Hi. Um, I'd just like to say uh, thankful for being a member of uh, Christian Science. Um, I missed last week, but I was able to make it this week. Um, I enjoyed the service, and um, I hope to continue growing in Christian Science. I'm learning a lot each week as I come to a uh, reading room every day, and i um, just thankful for being a part of Christian Science. Thank you. Thank you for your readings on hope. Um, we generally hope for um, what we perceive as good and what we would want for ourselves as good. Child might hope for a toy at Christmas. Um, and also, hope is generally that something is just beyond reach for whatever reason um, that if you if you if you had the friend you don't hope for a friend you've got the friend um, the um, so the hope is something that you could say one lacks or, or what is, doesn't have the capacity to seize um, well, I've always perceived uh, Christian science as good, as always explaining to me a higher, better sense of good. Um, I was raised in a Christian science Sunday school. And um, when I went to college, uh, there came a time when I sort of said I, I wanted to embrace this. There was a Christian Science organization on campus, which I attended, and um, you know I I wanted to learn and progress in Christian Science, and I reached out to a practitioner in the uh, summer between my freshman and sophomore year, and she uh, she gave me uh, Tomlinson's book Ten Years with Mary Baker Eddy to read. And I read that and uh, read passages and talked things over with the practitioner that summer. And I think that was probably when I took Christian science, you know, reach out and you say, yes, I do want that. Um, the, the economics of hope, hope is sort of, is not, is sort of a, a lower rung. It's a progressive, wonderful state. Uh, but better than hope is faith, faith uh, that uh, one believes that that good is present right now, perhaps. And even better than faith is understanding. Uh, that's even a higher state of thought. And, um, and then demonstration is the ultimate. And I think one of my hopes is to be a better able to demonstrate the science that I've always found to be a source of good, um, and uh, and the economics of hope is that you, you, we learn that it's it's right there, it's present. I mean, people are always giving lectures and trying to make uh, Christian science as available as it can be, and. Uh, eager to share. Um, and it is uh, it's so that it's it's something for hope, hope for, but it's there. It's it, it, God is always giving us the right ideas, giving us, if we turn to God and ask, what's the next step? Where do I go from here? That question is always answered. And it's um, it just takes the opinions to... to <laughs> Obey their instruction. Um, I'm I'm very grateful for Christian Science for the for the uh, unfolding of good and the being the source of good uh, in good in you know it's it's most valuable most 
treasured in bad times because you really need it, need to apply it. And um, uh, I'm just very grateful for that, uh, that Christian science has been a reliable rock of unfolding good. And I'm faithful that, that it's always open and available and God is always answering um, the heart's desire to rise up higher. In studying the lesson this week, um, there's a lot from Genesis, and um, especially the phrase we're all familiar with, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And as Christian scientists, we understand that there was no beginning. There is no beginning. Um, and then I came across something that... that um, amplified that idea a bit. And I wondered if it would be all right for me to share it. It's from the Journal of 1894. Um, he, God, is infinite, and the infinite has no beginning. He is eternal, and eternity has no beginning. Is there not, however, a sense in which there is a beginning? Is not the beginning when each individual awakens to an apprehension of his true relation to God, and hence to his own true selfhood? Does not God begin in each human consciousness in the degree in which such consciousness begins to reflect the divine character? by living in obedience to the divine commands. In this sense, there is a beginning. I really loved that idea. It was a new idea to me. And I, last year I'd been doing a lot of um, research on the topic of new birth, uh, and especially in, in miscellaneous writings. And now I, I kind of connect that idea of this ongoing, constant new birth in our consciousness. And I was, I was so grateful to come across that and, and a whole new line of thought to explore. And thank you very much for your readings tonight. Thank you. And thank you all for your testimonies, your prayers, your remarks, and your supportive presence. Let's conclude with singing hymn number 148. In heavenly love abiding, no change my heart shall fear, and safe is such confiding, for nothing changes here. The storm may roar without me, my heart may low be laid, but God is round about me, and can I be dismayed? Wherever he may guide me, no want shall turn me back. My shepherd is beside me, and nothing can I lack. His wisdom ever waketh, his sight is never dim. He knows the way he taketh, and I will walk with him. Green pastures are before me, which yet I have not seen. Bright skies will soon be o'er me, where darkest clouds have been. My hope I cannot measure. My path in life is free. My Father has my treasure, and he will walk with me. Number 148.